I, I was like, I was, I'm going to keep that in there, but I guess oh, I can't. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I would have, I would have recorded. I can't really recreate oh, yeah. that. I would have oh, recorded your love of the Weather Channel. I love the Weather Channel, dude. It's it's awesome. Weather's weather is like the most brutal and beautiful thing in the world. You can't mess with weather. <laughs> like wars and all that. Weather weather trumps that all the time. Weather's gonna weather, weather don't play. So Ned has been on board with us pretty much since the very beginning. And the really cool thing that I've noticed is that. When they first started with us, there were just a couple of products on the website, more than a couple, but they've really been increasing on what they're doing. And the latest of which really is the sleep blend that they're really pushing out there. 50 million Americans suffer from sleep disorders. Many of them are prescribed sleeping pills and subsequently become addicted. We've spoken about that before. Mm -hmm. And there's a better way. And that's why Ned created it. Sleep deeper for longer and wake up refreshed. Ned's Sleep Blend is a natural path to steady, consistent, and deeper sleep. This tincture blends CBN, a powerful cannabinoid that promotes sleep, with 750 milligrams of CBD made from the world's purest single source, full-spectrum hemp oil, and organic and wild-crafted botanicals used in traditional medicine to foster rest. If you want to know more about CBN, Cannabinol CBN is a cannabis compound that occurs naturally as the cannabis plant ages. Previously seen as a throwaway byproduct, it has recently been recognized as an all-natural way to catch some disease. And I can tell you for myself, man, getting back into the gym, I've been working out more now that things are opening up. And if you don't get a good night's sleep, it affects absolutely everything. And some of you guys need that boost. Yeah, I, I honestly... Uh... If you're a runner, it, it definitely affects you. You got to get your sleep. I can tell when my running is sluggish or when I'm fresh and I actually feel like I'm I'm young, <laughs> young again. But even when I was young as well, younger, um, yeah, when you don't have good enough sleep, you just you feel like you're running in quicksand and it's just it just everything is slow motion. And so and runners that can attest to that. So that's why you, they always I always advise you take a nap, get extra sleep. But if you're not sleeping well throughout the night, you're going to be able to tell no matter if you get a nap or not, which the, the sleep aid does. So get a good full night's sleep. You're going to feel better in the morning and feel more positive. And if you're like myself and Ian, you work out uh, regularly, it's going to affect your workouts positively. And especially if you're a runner, you can tell the difference if you have a full night's sleep or if you happen to be popping up every two or three times a night. So, yeah, check it out here, definitely and, and pair it with the CBD oil. And yeah, you're going to have awesome, nice sleep. Like I, I know I have since I started doing it. 100%. It affects your mood, affects everything. So uh, as we always say, Ned products do contain a minuscule amount of THC, less than 0.3% as allowed by law. This level of THC makes Ned full spectrum hemp a non-psychotropic, meaning it will not get you high despite the trace amounts of THC in full spectrum hemp. It is possible to fail a drug test, even at a low serving size. So if your livelihood depends on it, we strongly advise against using ingestible hemp products, but they have other things on the site like the um, immunity blend and the body butter. You could use all of that, but we like to throw that out there. And uh, with their ambassador email that we get regularly, I could I could let you guys in on this. They're going to have a 24-hour flash sale, $10 off all orders on October 29th and uh, through October 30th. So get on that. Yeah, it's only 24 hours. Uh, $10 off basically anyone who opts into the SMS alerts from Ned. And then on top of that, of course, if you want to check out Ned and try their CBD for yourself, we have a special offer for the podcast audience. Go to helloned.com slash battleline or enter battleline at checkout for 15% off your first one-time order or 20% off your first subscription order plus free shipping. That's H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D.com slash Battle line to get that 15% off or 20% off subscription order. Don't forget to use slash battle line or the promo code battle line. And uh, yeah, you'll be able to take advantage of that. Thank you, Ned. And of course, every show, our great friends at Fort Scott Munitions who cannot keep things stocked enough. And I moved away from the microphone because I do love my oh, Fort said, Scott. What? Yeah, no, I, I, I bought it. They didn't oh, send me it. Like, they the sent me it, but I. I used our promo code, everything. I was like, that is a badass hat. That is a badass hat. Yeah. So yeah, even if you're not shooting at the moment or you don't have or you don't need ammo, they have great merchandise. So yeah, check them out. Fort Scott is a manufacturer of multi-federal patented solid copper and brass CNC spun ammunition that is designed to tumble upon impact <clears throat> in soft tissue 
leaving devastating wound channels for faster bleed out and quicker incapacitation. This ammunition was originally developed to innovate and improve on the standard of military grade ammunition design. It was found that not only did their ammo, the TUI ammo, tumble upon impact, outperform competitors in the self-defense industry, but it quickly became apparent that it would be a top contender for you hunters out there alike. With the ammunition being CNC spun, the tolerances are some of the tightest on the market, ensuring that you receive the same results with each pull of the trigger. Fort Scott Munitions is available throughout privately owned businesses in all 50 states, as well as direct online through fortscottmunitions.com. And I know you're continuing to do more and more yeah. with those guys. Oh, we, we well, even the new battle line shirts, the battle line tactical shirts, the forge ahead shirts, those are made by Fort Scott. So their apparel is, they have their own apparel, like you said, uh, and the hats are awesome. Um, and then we'll have a, a look like now when I speak to probably for Scott and I will do we do one training event a year. So we're going to have one in June with Battle Line and for Scott where for Scott hosts it out there. And it looks like June. I'm trying to firm up the schedule. But yeah, a lot of stuff as ammo with them. We'll have a ton of line of ammo hopefully here very soon. I'm probably next year when they, ammo, when they have enough ammo, we're coming back to making them all. We can make new ammo and, and do a new line. They just are so far behind with the. And yeah, so is everybody. I mean, just everyone. Everybody. Yeah. So, um, uh, but yeah, many other things. And of course, they they fully support their huge support of 14th Hour Foundation, always providing money, always donating to the foundation. So, uh, you know, Fort Scott, great people there, Kraft family. You know, we got and we got Robbie down there, and we got Preston down there. All those guys are amazing, and they they really take care of us. And also, they do our targets, uh, Tread Proof Battle Line Fort Scott uh, targets. So. Yeah, check them out on my website, christonoprano.com, and and you can see all the stuff that they do for us. And then, of course, just 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 their own ammo, and check out their uh, Fort Scott's own website as well. And yep. you can see all the different gear. That hat is awesome, though. Yeah, man. Yeah, Fort, fortscottmunitions.com. Use exclusive promo code BATTLELINE. Use that for 15% off your order. You use that every time, except on subscriptions, I found out. So one-time orders, 15% off your order when you use BATTLELINE. Only available to listeners of the Battle Line podcast. Fort Scott Munitions is a proud supporter of this guy, Chris Peranto, Battle Line Tactical, and the Battle Line podcast. Let's hit the music. Let's get into everything. Arr. From Omaha, Nebraska to New York City, from planet Earth to extraterrestrial life in space, a podcast with no equal, engaged in unconventional warfare through your speakers and headphones. This is a show about embracing the suck, conquering your demons, and finding God in the face of adversity. Chris Tonto Peranto. Switch is on. Motherfucker, I'm going to shoot you in the face. Ian Scotto. You know, Ian and I have been dating for a long time. <laughs> You are now tuned into the Battle Line Podcast. The switch is on. Very excited to have L. Christian Bustler on this episode. A guy I've, you know, wanted on, and he's wanted to come on since we started. It's just very hard to fit everybody in, but he's got an incredible story to share, incredible book that he has written. And uh, before we get to him, I mean, what else is new? We have the uh, the final presidential debate last night. We have we the did. third game of the World Series tonight. We did. Are we in the World Series? Are you serious? There's a World Series? Right? <laughs> I have no idea. Are you joking me right now? Or... No, I'm not jerking your chain. I had no idea. Uh, the World Series there... has been weird because I've gotten so used to seeing no fans in the stands that I'm like, this is weird. There's fans in the stands. Who, who's, who's in it? Seriously, I have no idea. Who's in it? Oh, the Dodgers in Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay is in the world. <laughs> are you kidding me? That's like You're saying, truly living under a rock. I, that's like saying the Cleveland Browns are, are in the Super Bowl. 
It's a, that's a, that's the greatest thing in the world. Sorry for all you Browns fans, but you haven't been good since the, since the the dog pound back in the day. That's or even though even here. though I'm not a football guy, the Jets do. The Je- uh, yeah, the Jets even ain't good anymore. Again, I don't. No. I haven't paid Part- attention. I don't pay attention to any sports anymore. I just, I can't, it's, it's if, when it goes back to just being sports and not movements and messages and all, and just sports and, and you know what though, I'm going to call you watch. out on, I'm going to call you out on that a little bit because hockey was very apolitical for the most that, part. You know, you're you're right. you're, no, ho- ho- I should say that you're right. Hockey is always hockey or you track and field is another one. That's awesome. I watched that. That's that's on. I, so I don't say oh, I don't golf, watch golf. Golf I, never talks about politics. I, yeah, but I I can't watch. I, I try. My dad, I'm not at that age yet. I think I need to be 60 to start watching. I, golf. I like watching golf, man. It's relaxing. It, it, no, it's, I love playing it. And I grew up around golf. My dad's a golf pro. My brother's a golf pro. They work at the oh, country sure. club there. Oh, yeah, no, they're, they're amazing golfers. We, we started golfing when I was five. My dad cut off clubs and, you know, cause we didn't, they didn't make little clubs at the time. So he cut off his clubs and taped it with electrical tape. And my brother and I started golfing at five years. I love golfing. It's just, I went to, went to the army. My brother continued to golf <laughs> after college. And no, he's, my brother's amazing. My dad, you know, he's getting up there in age. So, He's not as good as he used to be, but he was a scratch golfer, you know, for many, many years. And, you know, golfers, fun. I love golf, but I just, I suck. My family is good. I'm terrible at it. But I, I agree with you, dude. It, I just, it's hard for me to watch. I don't have a player to watch anymore. It used to be Jack Nicholas. I love, I wanted to see him win. I and still then, like Tiger Woods. I, I was for, until, until his, you know, until he's got caught cheating on his wife and his wife got kicked his ass with his own set of golf clubs. I'm that not made things exciting, though. What happened. That is just scuttled, but I don't know for sure. That's that, right. I think that's what happened, yeah. I, I believe actually, so. I, I know one of the guys that was on a security detail. Um, <laughs> I won't give his name out. but what, Was I, it a seal? Was it a seal? Because I know uh, Tiger's very, like, fond of the seals. He, it was, he's actually a, he was actually a former force recon Marine. But, oh, okay. Uh, but that was, yeah, and... Um, yeah, that's, so that's uh yeah. Uh, it, 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 I'm not saying he'd said anything because, and I'm not going to say who he is because he's not. But yeah, he, he remembered he had to go pull. Basically, yeah, I remember him saying pull his wife off, tired before he killed him because it was it was that bad. Damn. And uh, yeah, and then also a uh, uh, a guy in Vegas that knows a little bit of what went place and who the actual woman was. But again, this is all hearsay. It's all I'm just you can say Tony, you're full of shit. That's fine because I have nothing to verify it with. And I'm never going to give these guys true names out that told me these things. So, you know, it's always a little bird. Who told you? Well, they did. Same thing here. You don't believe you me. Believe, it's, it's believable, though. I mean, he was living a total rock star life. Yeah. But uh, you, I was just thinking when I said the Jets, though, earlier of that hilarious Artie Lang joke about the Jets. Oh, yeah. I, uh, Artie Lang, I'm a big Artie Lang fan. And he had a joke oh, yeah. in his stand up where he said, uh, he's like, when I, he said that his uncle said to him, He's like, when I was younger, I was into football and I was into the Jets, but then I got interested in girls. But now I'm interested in the Jets again because a girl won't always fuck you, but the Jets will but the always Jets, fuck I remember, you. I remember that. Actually, I think I heard that driving on the road, listening to either. Uh, I listen to the comedy shows when I'm driving on Sirius, like Netflix is a joke or comedy greats. And I, I want to say Artie was on there and I was listening to it driving to Chicago. I remember him saying that was hilarious because they do bits stand-up bits where they take the best yeah and, yep. oh, and when you're driving i i fall asleep to music so i gotta have somebody talking and i i can't turn it on a, a news channel anymore because it's just hate 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 so i i just i have netflix as a joke and then um comedy central and then uh a kevin hart show kevin hart's channel and then you, i just flip back and forth and listen to the like like the the hottest or not the hottest the uh, the best stand-up little clips and Artie Lang was on there. I remember hearing that. That was hilarious because he's, he's so true. I, I, unless the Jets are good now. Again, I, I don't know. I, I don't no, know. I think, I think they're like forever terrible and I'm not <laughs> even a football guy with, uh, yeah, <laughs> with uh, the MLB right now, it's, it's all tied up. But like I said, it's, it's actually interesting seeing some fans in the stands now. It gives me some hope that things are going to open up at some point. I don't know what's going on. I mean, and then the thing is, as I said, the final presidential debate, and and I, the reason I say this is like a never-ending election is because, I mean, you guys know it listening. The, the uh, We're not even going to know who's the president on election night. We're not going to know the week of because they're, yeah. I mean, you, you probably, I think you know about this at least in uh, 
you know, Pennsylvania, which is a swing state, you're going to get to vote three days after the election happened. Yeah. I mean, it's like, what could go wrong? Uh, I don't I, know. I, yeah, and who, who knows anymore with everything, all the shenanigans that take place, and they do. I mean, to, to just, it, it, that it, even if the, ever the election results are going to be accurate ever again, that's what's sad. It's like, are we ever going to have an actual election that's, that is 100% integrity, 100% truthful? I I don't know. I, I I would I would never I would say never never we never are again because of all the all the just crap that goes on with with elections and the sides and the and the people in positions that can manipulate outcomes and so forth. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist because I'm not going to say one side is the one that does it and the other one doesn't. No, say, but you know what? what I, I I will a little bit for some reason. I'm getting a ton of echo on on today, but I don't know why. But um. Anyway, uh, what, what I was going to say is that on this, I actually will say, I think it's one side. I mean, the, the on this particular issue, the Republicans are pushing for pretty much a regular election the way we've always had. Uh, the Democrats are pushing for, like I said, in Pennsylvania, they could vote three days after the election. Yeah, well, it's going to yeah. lead to ballot harvesting. It's going to lead to election fraud. Yeah, Anybody who tells you is. different is, you know, and, and you guys know this. I have no dog in this fight. I'm not voting for either of these people. If I was, I would tell you I'm. I'm going to vote third party like I did last election. But yes, I do think on the left, they are pushing for, I mean, I think the last election, it, it went the way it went. Um, there was, as be. much as they'd like to say a Russia hack, there was no hack. There was different countries that bought Facebook ads and things <laughs> like that. There was no hack though. But no. when you say that you could vote three days after an election, it's problematic to say the least. Well, you, you know, you're just opening yourself up for fraud or, on the other side, you're opening yourself up for a greater chance to win. And we're talking about golf. You're you, basically you're, you're adding a handicap onto the election, is what you're doing. <laughs> you're, you're making it so you can come out on top. So uh, yeah, and that's that's horseshit. It is that you. It, it is what it is. It, it, if you win, you win. If you lose, you lose. That's just how it goes. Stop trying to make it so you have a better chance of winning by manipulating tangible and objective numbers you, you've turned the, the election into a subjective numbers to to manipulation and and that's horseshit and, and, and for people not to stand up and not vote for that side just because of the bill their willingness to manipulate and try to manipulate to win that crushes me too it's like really people that's what you you want it but i would say you want to cheat to win uh, and that's what you're going to vote for well it's going to bite us in the ass down the road. And that's how it always, it, you know, it always works. So, um, uh, brother, I, again, I, 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 I don't know. I don't pay attention. I, I didn't even know there was a debate last night, but being in that past one where I was heavily involved with that last election, I can honestly say, yeah, it, it always, it, in the last shit, what is it? 2012. You're 2016. Right. It, it, it is 20, it, 2016. 2016. Well, when I mean, so when I started to pay it, really pay attention to it, I should say 2012, and that was after the the. I never really paid attention to it till after. Gotcha, okay. got yeah, yeah. You're no, you're right. Let me clarify. But um, no, I I I I have I have to say it's it's been more of the left that has been trying to change the rules, so they have a better chance of winning because in a fair fight in a fair election they're not going to win. It's, it's, they're not. It's not going to happen. I don't. I don't. I, wow, I'm getting a ton of echo right now. Brother, do you, do you want is. me? Hey, I can go. You want me to go get mine and see if that helps? Maybe. Yeah. I'm just. I'm just hearing. It's like <laughs> every time the I talk. World is going on. And I. Yeah. I got gotta, nothing, brother. Once, that, once you get the. Uh, once you get the microphone that that I think Tanya. Hey, Tanya ordered order it. Yeah. Chat, Tanya, so. we, we can talk. But let me let me run downstairs. I thought I had them up here. And okay. I'll, cool. I'll, cool. I'll put them in. Okay. All right. Let me see here. Maybe this will help. Okay. Yeah, and I, I said my phone vibrations off. Um, I'm not scraping anything. I'm not touching anything. I'm setting the book down. So, there you go. How about that? We're good. Yeah. No, you sound way better. You sound. Yeah. Way let's better. let's right. do that. Um, but sound, dude, you sound a million times better. Okay. Good. Thing. Good. Yeah. Let's well, stick well, with that until you get the new mic. No, what I was going to say though, I I don't know if I would agree with you there because I do think this is going to be an extremely close election. Um. You know, just looking at at what we have so far, I mean, we know polling last election was extremely inaccurate, but I, I do think it's going to be extremely close. But these changing of of the way we do elections with the mail-in ballots, ballot harvesting, with uh, 
with voting days after the election has actually happened, that's what's going to sway things. Well, I, and that's but that's again, that's that's where the manipulation comes in, because uh, if if it was something that was that was so egregious that, yes, we had a landslide, but now you're we're now we're going to change the rules. So it's close. I, I, you know, okay, I agree with you. But I don't see it being a landslide. No, no, I, I don't either. I don't either. What I'm saying is, is that what it takes to manipulate? Is just those little things to win. Sure. Okay, let's manipulate this. Let's manipulate this so we can get, you know, the the one percent that we need to win. Because I agree with you. It's, I, and I think for the most part, most elections that are coming in the future are always going to be close from here on out because we are so divided, and the politicians have pushed us that way, and so is the media. But, um, but yeah, those are those little things. Those little. Like you said, those little manipulations, those little changes that can cause that one percent swing one way or the other, and I, it, and that is my opinion from what I've seen. It's normally been the left that's trying to do the changes. It's trying to trying to change the outcome or trying to change the electoral college or this or that so we can win. Where it's like, dude, if you if you win, you win. If you don't, you don't. Try again. Put another candidate in there, and Democrats are going to win whether if they win this time or if they. When the next after the next four years, they, it's going to happen. It, it, it's not going to stay one unless we continue to let manipulation happen. It's not going to stay one party that's in power for forever. It just it doesn't work that way. There's always going to be a candidate that comes in on one side that you're eventually like, oh, you know what? This is this is the person right now, though, like yourself, you're voting for neither of them. So because we don't have a great candidate on either side, it's like it's like lesser two evils again, which is yeah. not where I, we want to be. I, you know what? It's like normally I would I would 100 percent agree with you on that, that it's the pendulum is going to sway. But there's been so many things that have been changing, because also if you if we do end up having a path to legalization and then you legalize everybody who's here illegally and they all vote a certain way yeah, yeah, and then you change the Supreme Court, you stack the Supreme Court, which they're talking about. That's going to change everything. Um, I don't know. We could lead to, you know, the. The things that are going on kind of is how you lead to one party in power. The nah, you're, you're, you're it's right, yeah. it's a very strange time in the country. And I don't want to harp on it too much. Um, but you know, at the same time, I mean it's a, it's a crazy time. Oh, by the way, last show did excellent. I think it's gonna end up being our most listened to show. If was it you just me and you? Yeah, just, just us. Because we're because we're because we're <laughs> freaking awesome, dude. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, I think people dig the questions and and because I honestly when I listen to shows talk shows on the radio I do occasionally but sometimes you have good ones where it's just hey listeners to put your questions in and we can answer them it's just when you open it up and you have allowed people to call in where you get the guy that rambles like me on the phone but and, you know, <laughs> like, I don't want to hear this shit anymore get your question okay I'm flipping the channel but that's great, man. We should we'll do one of those. And the book things was a great idea. That was a fantastic. Thanks, idea. man. Yeah, I still have to send them out. I have them right next to me because I've been I'm at my parents' house, like unpacking everything while I'm here. So I was like, all right, here are all these books. I'll be sending them out over the weekend. Uh, but yeah, no, it was a. And I'll be honest, it's also the clickbaity type title. People see Trump's name, they're like, what did they say about Trump? I have to listen. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. I knew it was going to get listeners what? because of that. And, and but then they listen and they're like, okay, this was really five minutes of a two-hour podcast. Yeah, it's yeah, good. Uh, Good. Yeah. So I will get to one question here before we get to Christian. Um, this was a good one for you from Bear sent to battlelinepodcast at gmail.com. It occurs to me a few days ago when hanging with a Canadian military veteran buddy, we actually had a hard time. He actually had a hard time describing the, or said we, so maybe both of them, uh, describing the quote, emotional atmosphere in the first seconds of contact, right? If you could articulate how you would describe the mental and emotional atmosphere at that exact moment, respectfully, Bear. I, I think ours was different um, because it, we weren't shocked. Like it wasn't an ambush where we rolled into an ambush. And this is that night. There are differences where I have rolled into something and it just was, oh, shit, you got to you got to jump on it and get ready because you roll into an ambush. You roll into a, a surprise sniper fire that you're not planning on. 13 hours or Benghazi was different because we were watching the attack for almost 30 minutes trying to get out the gate so it wasn't a shock to the system that we're going to get attacked we knew that we were going into a bus so, and, and honestly i think that's worse because you sit there and you think about it where when it, it's just something that's caught you by surprise like a uh, rolling over a bridge or, or standing at a checkpoint trying to direct traffic and there's sniper fire that you didn't expect 
you just react and it goes into, you know, it goes into, and I, I don't believe in muscle memory. I'm not going to say that or instincts or anything. It, you just go into whatever your highest level of training is and you start moving habitually. You start doing whatever habit forming movements that you've been able to obtain over, over your training, over other, other, uh, other deployments, other, other, other uh, series of duress that you're under that your body goes into. It's, it's just going to a habit, habit what you do. And, but you don't think, you don't, you're not, it's, it's not really thinking out there. You're just reacting. And eh, I'm being a little bit of hypocritical there. Cause they always say you're always thinking, but it's just very quick thoughts. What's the habit? What do I do? What do I do? What have I done in the past? What do I do to handle the stress? What do I do when there's cypher fire or an ambush? What, what, how do I react to it? And it's, 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 it's reacting, reacting, reacting where Benghazi it was. Okay. All right. What are we getting ourselves into? Man, that fire's getting heavier and heavier. Holy shit. Now it's getting heavier. Now it's going to get worse. And you start to be able to play mind games with yourself. And, and that's what you have to stop. But that's from the training. That's from being overseas for many years. That's for having a tremendous team that is also confident, that is the same mindset as you are. It's like, okay, once we get there, we will do what we need to do based off what we're walking into. And it comes from years of training. And as far as your buddy knows, if you've been in the service for many years or been in special operations, that's what it falls down to. But yeah, that's where Benghazi happened. It, it was more of just making sure you didn't let the stress and the adrenaline and the emotion of everything spinning around you overtake your senses and overtake your body before you even got there. And, and that's that was having, you just, you have to control your emotions. Where again, being surprise attack or having something that just happens to you, you just go on on whatever habit that you've put your body through and your, for your ability to handle the rest. It's that fight or flight that, that adrenaline kicks in and you either run away or you go towards the attack and you take it on or you curl up into the fetal position and your body just shuts down because you get so overwhelmed with fear. So, um, yeah, I am going through both. That was, it was, you know, I can, I, I think I can speak with some legitimacy on, on, on both because I've been in both situations before. And, uh, I have to say the Benghazi situation was much harder because we did have the opportunity to think about what could happen or what's going to happen. And I'll be honest, when we rolled out the gate and I think Jack felt the same way, even he even mentioned it in 13 hours because we had a bunch of turtles that sat in our, our little pet turtles that sat in our little middle, little, like a little middle grass area. And I remember him saying to, and when we did the book, I remember he, he said, his thoughts, he goes, yeah, I looked at the turtles and I, was, I thought to myself, that's the last time we're going to see our pet turtles hmm. because we basically thought that we were, I mean, we, we let them entrench themselves. We knew they had so much more superior numbers. We knew we had no help that it's like, okay, well, we're basically going to our grave, but fuck it. Let's go. Switches on. <laughs> and that's, and, um, and that's, that's something that you, you have to learn with. It's, it's, it, I don't think you just are born with that. It comes through working with guys before you that have gone through those experiences and you watch how they handle it. And then with age and experience. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely, man. So battlelinepodcast at gmail.com. I have to say, this sounds perfect today. Like your connection is good. Yeah. And this sounds great. It's, so we're, we're good. And then we're You're going to hear the difference when you listen back. We're going to get the microphone. That would be better. It's definitely the yeah. computer that was jacking things up. I, it, that's no, it. you're great. Yeah. You're great now. So um, yeah, I want to make sure we get to El Christian bus. Yeah, 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 I'm yeah, cutting yeah. you off here. So before we get to Christian, as we always let you guys know, Fort Scott Munitions is a manufacturer of multi-federal patented solid copper and brass CNC spun ammunition that is designed to tumble upon impact in soft tissue, leaving devastating wound channels for faster bleed out and quicker incapacitation. This ammunition was originally developed to innovate and improve on the standard of military grade ammunition design. It was found that not only did the TUI ammunition outperform competitors in the self-defense industry, but it quickly became apparent that it would be a top contender for hunters alike. With the ammunition being CNC spun, the tolerances are some of the tightest on the market, ensuring that you receive the same results every time you pull that trigger. Fort Scott Munitions is available throughout privately owned businesses in every state, as well as direct online. Go right now to fortscottmunitions.com. Use exclusive promo code BATTLELINE for 15% off your order. Only available to listeners of the Battle Line podcast. If you're driving or anything as you're listening, you can just, when you get a chance, go to the description of this episode and you'll see the link right there. Fort Scott Munitions is a proud supporter of Chris Peranto, Battle Line Tactical, and the Battle Line podcast. With that, 
L. Christian Bustler, author of No Tougher Duty, No Greater Honor, a memoir of a mortuary affairs, uh, a memoir of a mortuary affairs marine, veteran of Operation Enduring Freedom one, two, and four, wounded in combat. I'm I'm saying everything wrong today. Wounded in combat <laughs> in Iraq, and uh, you know what's the funny thing? I will say before we get into anything of of content. Uh, Christian has been listening to the show and like supporting us since day one. And I feel like such an asshole because literally since last <laughs> year, when we started the show, I was like, we're going to get you on. I promise. And then like another month yeah. goes by and I'm like, I'm going to get you on promise. We're, we're going to make it happen. And I, and you probably were like, this guy is blowing me off because it's probably oh, the same thing yeah. I would tell someone who actually was blowing off and be like, yeah, we'll make it happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I actually did want to get you on since the beginning. Cause I think your book is remarkable. So, well, thank you so much. <laughs> thank God, you for I mean, having me on here too this is he was blowing you awesome. off don't, don't let him fucking fool you dude. <laughs> he blowing, he's like ah oh, that son of a bitch you're fine fine oh. we'll have him on let's get him on <laughs> no, no. i wasn't no. i wasn't pushing him i knew i was gonna eventually be on at some point yeah no, no and, and i mean you've been on on some major podcasts like you've yeah. been on jocko's podcast which i'll let's be honest far bigger than this podcast so you've been doing big things and the, the cool thing I will say in regards to you putting out a book is you really did what, what Chris and I talk about yeah. all the time in this podcast is that you had a story and you said, I'm not going to wait on anyone to publish this. I'm going to put it out because right. the, I'll be honest, there is like a certain stereotype of guys who get approached by a publisher to put out a book. It's someone like Chris, yeah. it's someone in special operations. But your story to me is just as important as any of those other stories. And you're a guy who works a regular job. You're a father. And you just said... I need to tell this story and the book is doing great. Yeah. Cause the, uh, all those, those experiences were really eating me up. Uh, you know, cause my job is not the ordinary, um, kick down the doors, uh, or, you know, admin job or anything like that. Mine was dealing with, uh, um, getting our fallen home, recovering them from the battle, uh, from the, uh, the scene of the incident and processing the remains and getting them home. So I've seen hundreds of guys yeah. that had pros and so I internalized all of those cases that we had worked on and I still I still feel responsible for them today to preserve their honor. So but uh keeping that with me I was it was eating me up and I needed to put those experiences so somewhere. And um I ended up starting to write to help therapeutically get it out. And uh, I took advice of a, a of a uh, Vietnam War veteran. He said, "Write it stuff, write the stuff down, then go over, say your goodbyes, and burn them." And that's what I ended up doing. My wife convinced me to go ahead and start publishing them. And after a while, I taught myself how to write, and then I said, "Why not? Let's go ahead and publish it." Yeah, so it's that, done remarkably well. I, and you, you're, I'm glad you're saying that, brother, because that's what we try to tell veterans, and I try to say it as well. It's, it's therapeutic. You don't feel like the old stigma where you're, oh, hey, look at me, look what I did. I'm putting it in a book, which, you know, we, which, which we used to make fun of seals about all the time. I, 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 <laughs> but again, it's not. That's not the case. It's, it's not. It's, it's. You've seen something, you and you have seen some shit. I, I don't get. You've seen more death than any of us door kickers have. You have complete and. And man, I can't even imagine having to go every time to a scene and cl it's like and clean up, clean it up. It really is yeah. what you're doing and, and seeing, seeing the, you know, seeing the things you saw, seeing, and I hope I'm not bringing up bad thoughts to oh, you. I'm you're sorry fine. if I am, but, but, you know, even just, you know, finding, and I'm sure you have going there and, and seeing a, seeing a flag from a, from a guy's uniform that's on the ground. I mean, just little things like that, that would stick with Personal me. Personal items. Personal yeah. items always stuck with me. Uh, yeah. You know, you get the you get the pictures, especially yeah. with the families and the kids. Uh, we have one guy who had an ultrasound in his helmet. Um, uh, yeah, wow. You know, you'll get uh, dog tags that we literally uh, had uh, hammered out this blown up Bradley that had melted on top of itself, and underneath all the slag metal, we found it still welded on the bottom of you know the negative side of this big chunk of metal. And to me, it was something that was very special because now this dog tag meant something because it, here was something that that guy, that soldier wore around his, his heart, yeah. his next to his heart every single day. He went to combat with it. Then now it's something that we were able to recover from that scene, pass it along the chain of custody, and it goes to that, that person's family so, oh, for, so that they would hold it close to their hearts. You know, and, and to me, 
whenever we we worked with the the fallen um i always told my guys we work for the families uncle mm -hmm. sam may pay us but we're handling the remains of these fallen uh warriors that you know we have to do our very best because they're looking at us oh you're right you know they're they're making sure they may not never know or ever think about our jobs but we want to do that extra step to make sure that we did the absolute best to take care of our fallen and they deserved it. Well, and that's, that's part of the army values. Your, your yeah. respect and honor big time. You, you exemplify honor more than anything. And uh, even, even guys that have won the medal of honor, which you did. And, and just what you said, you told your guys, that is, that is the, the army value of, of honor right there and, and duty shit and duty as well. So, um, right. And I want you to say, and I want your guys to know, uh, and yourself that the stuff you did and we don't I don't want to talk negative about it I, I think it's remarkable and I think it's 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 necessary to have stories like that because but even though you've seen things that people would think is negative in my mind being through some negative things myself where people will think that it's negative like man you got to experience that uh, to me I am I'm I'm like I'm in awe I'm like man I and honestly I wish I I wish I would have been there with you like man he got to see a dog I mean, and it's not a bad I'm not I'm not trying to say things well, bad to the family to just, guys wow home. yeah it's like wow you gotta you gotta do all that who gets to see that who gets to experience that that is a positive to me i guess that's my way of thinking half you know, full um, less than half empty it's my my job it, it was different than most people because we had to wear so many different hats yeah so we had to wear the uh you know the tactical hat when we go out on scene yep. most of us were grunts going out there and the whole idea was per, do our own uh, perimeter security yeah you had to do your own security yeah and go in there and find the guys and be able to extract them and get them out. But we also had to do the stuff on the scene as the unit members were watching us recover their remains, their their buddies out of the scenes. And then we had to do the whole CSI thing, you know, yeah. going in and going like an archaeological dig and squaring off things and going in with, with dental picks and finding the tiniest pieces of human remains as possible, you know, looking for wedding rings and... Yeah. and Stuff like that, that stuff that means, I mean, it's priceless to a family member. Yeah. yeah. So to get that back to them. And like I said, I, I we were working for the families and, and it, Uncle Sam may have paid us, but I wanted to make sure. And it, it's something that was honorable that oh, you definitely know, wanted honorable. to walk away from knowing we did everything humanly possible to get this, you know, soldier, sailor, airman, marine home. And and you brought closure, whether you think right. you did or not. I mean, right. the, the you know the 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 thankless part of it is is you probably will never see the closure that you. you but that's not why you do it. I don't need right. to see the. I, I we, you did it because that that's what you did. That was the honorable thing to do. And, and bringing closure to the families. I know you. I know you did on all mm -hmm. of them. And that's amazing, bro. I I I'm just, I I. I I want people to read your book because they need to hear those things. And and it is a different take on, on it's war. A totally different story oh, than yeah, yeah. The, what the normal military yeah. uh, story is about. Most people think it's all about, you know, the, the jet fighters and, you know. It's all guns and glory and guts and all. Yeah, and it's, it's, not, it's, it's not. It's, it's not. not and all. plus my book, um, I, I express a lot of things that most books don't. I, I want to express the emotional side of it. What it's like to actually lose a buddy over there. What it's like what, for what, all the thoughts that was going through my head. Because initially I wasn't trying to write to publish. I was just right trying to get it out and, and help maybe preserve it for my kids and my grandkids. And, you know, let that pass down, down the chain here. And the wife said, hey, it's good enough to get published. And I was like, <laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, hey, the wives are the bosses of the family. And my yeah, wife's absolutely. the boss too. Yeah, so, but, no, no. And another thing that, that I hope that somebody else picks up that, that people come home and they deal with what the, the PTSD that I had to deal with is that me getting it on paper helped my, uh, my situation at home because we were fighting. My wife yeah. never understood what I went through. There was no frame of reference for her. So she was able now to pick up a story that I had wrote and then she understood why Thanksgiving sucks for me because it was yeah. days after that is a buddy of mine had got killed. Yeah. We had to process his remains or certain situations where, you know, when I got blown up, um, where, you know, I ended up internalizing all that 
And so if a neighbor blows up a fireworks down, <laughs> down the street and I'm unaware it goes off, you know, I hit the ground. And it's, a, it's just going back to survival mode. Uh, there's no there's no long way around the survival mode. It's a direct connect from A to B. And so once that initial sound, a thump in your chest goes off, I feel like I need to get down. So, you know. It's, it, you know what? I, I, I just want to jump in here. It's interesting you say that because Chris and I, I think around maybe July 4th, we were talking and honestly a little jokingly about the idea of veterans who were worried about fireworks going off. And, and Honestly, every veteran I've talked to is like, ah, that doesn't really happen. So for you, that is oh, that yeah. that's actually a I'd thing. Say, and that's that is that why? Because because it doesn't bother me at all. I, and I've and honestly, I been around a lot of explosions over the mm -hmm. years, and it doesn't bother me at all. And, and the reason it's bothering you is it because you internalize it so much. And and you know, I, and there there is different training that comes through going through special operations and going through regular army and I'm not knocking. It's just, we got more money. We can do, we can blow each other up on a daily, <laughs> on a daily basis to get used to it. You can throw flashbangs down the hallway and get away with it. And, and there was a reason to the madness. That's why it gets, I, I'm, I honestly, I feel it and it's, it doesn't bother me. Um, but is it because you internalize? And again, if that's the case, is it you, mm -hmm. for so long that you just kept it inside? And this is great because it tells guys, don't keep it inside. Get that right. shit out because it's going to yeah. have detrimental effects down the line with yourself, with like you which is what you're saying right now. And that is detrimental. That's you know that is something that's a negative. You don't want to live like you that know, where a car backfires and you have to and you exactly. hit the deck. I've had that. Um, I've had that happen. I, I I was a marine reservist, so uh, when I, in my civilian job, I was a mailman, and I've had cars backfire. <laughs> And I end up hitting the deck. All my mail goes <laughs> everywhere. Oh, like, and people looking at me like I got shot or something. <laughs> but you know, it, it's it's um, it's what it is. Where you have to be able to accept it and 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 to be able to move on. Um, I've now got to a point where I can now watch it. If I'm I'm like at a fireworks show, I can, if I watch it and then I'm okay. But it's the times where I'm caught unaware. And, and that's when, okay, that, that just got me or, um, being at a grocery store and somebody opens up the milk, uh, thing and lets the door slam. And I, and and you throw, and you, turn around, you throw, you throw, uh, punch him. Oh, uh, shit, sorry. Sorry. It's and just here's, a, here's another one. Um, I was at Kroger and I seen a guy run out of, of the, uh, the meat freezer with a ski mask on. In a black <laughs> jumpsuit, and I reached down to try to grab my M9, and it wasn't there. I'm in Kroger, right? I, I try to because I'm thinking I'm, you know, I'm pointing that guy. I'm thinking bad guy, bad guy, bad guy. So I grabbed an onion, and I was sitting there waiting to throw. Yeah. But I was like, but I'm in Kroger. I'm going to throw this <laughs> onion at him. But I'm in Kroger, so. <laughs> yeah, actually, I, I'm. By the way, I really appreciate you you telling this because a lot of guys, if they had these stories, they'd be like. This is too embarrassing. No, no, and I think the fact that you put out this book, you're able to be like, you know what? I'm going to tell my story. Well, I'm okay know, with and, expressing it. And a guy I, like myself, well, I want to hear it because I, I, re <laughs> I, I relate to that. Like, holy shit, that's hilarious. Yeah. Uh, and, and I love to hear because I, because I, I, I get that. I get the feel of, of just doing something that you're, again, you're, you're, we just talked about habitual movements and, yeah. and, and your, your highest level of training. And that's what you did. You did something. And it's like, if I was your instructor or your sergeant, I'm like, well, shit, at least you did something there. True. <laughs> I mean, then we, then we laugh about it, but that's why I get it. Cause it, it, it does remind me of, it does remind me of, of things like being yeah. back in the service. And it's just exactly. the jackassery that you, you have to laugh at, even though, to most people, like man, that's just that's terrible. That's, no, it's not. It's, that's fucking hilarious, man. That's awesome. <laughs> well, and you figured, did something. I figured that more that I put myself out there, they might be able to identify with other folks that are having problems and and stuff. And I had, can see, I can look back upon my life and see where I've been getting better and better and better and better. And um, I am from, you know, when I came home, I was at the bottom of the barrel, you know, alcoholic. You know, yeah. drinking and 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 not looking past, you know, tomorrow, and be feeling like I was a prisoner in my own home. 
to now being, you know, I wrote the book. It was able to open a lot of doors up to me mentally, physically. Now I'm in, uh, I just finished uh, lineman school. I'm in hopefully getting hired with Duke Energy. Wow. You know, my, my life is totally flipped. And what is what it happened is the main thing was, is my candor. It, able to able to talk about it. If you don't talk about it, you never let it go. You never let it release it. At least try to make your life easier by letting the people who love you and, 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 and surround you understand a little bit about what you went through and not just say, you'll never understand it. So um, I, I, I agree. I know I agree. I, you, you have to bring them in and, and it allows you to heal. But I, I think a lot of guys stop doing that because they'll start to put it out and they think they're going to heal right away. No, it's like, guys, no, it doesn't. It doesn't work. It, it may be a month. It may be 10 years. But if you don't do it, you're not going to heal at all. It's like shaking up that pop bottle and you never open it. Right. You're, it's building. It's building. It's building. Eventually, it's going to explode or you can unscrew the cap and let it let the, all the carbonation out just a little bit at a time. And eventually right. you're going to get back to normal. And, and then, and, and that's essentially from what I'm hearing is what you did. And that's what I did. And, but we, we both, and I know you have too, and we, we can talk about that. We all have setbacks too. When we're going through it like, oh man, everything's going great. Oh shit. I just fell back a few yards. Yeah. I got to work that way back up. So, um, I don't know, maybe get into something like that where we're in the past that, that, yeah, you were doing well, and but you had that little setback and then how you overcame it. So it's, it's the old one step forward, two steps back. Would you, can you give us an example that maybe over the past few years since you've mm. written the book, if there's not, that's even better. But I know I have, I, I have, I've done some stupid things, but I recovered from them because it was a mistake. No, um, I stopped taking my meds at one point and yeah, I just felt like I was so, um, I felt like a loser because I couldn't function without my meds, you know, uh, a sleep med, yeah, yeah. you know, and yeah. all that kind of stuff. And and I didn't want to live my life being so attached to something. So I decided to stop taking my meds. Well, we went to a Kid Rock concert. Bad idea. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so all the anxiety of being all enclosed. All enclosed, all yeah. In. Yeah. And stuff. So I only thing I know how to do is start pounding beers and stuff. The next thing you know, I'm I'm not doing well. And oh yeah. Stuff and I'm I'm pissed off. Um, I ended up. Uh, my wife grabbed the kids when she got we got home. She took off. She thinking that I might lose my mind. Yeah. I ended up telling everybody that I didn't deserve to live. And so they ended up calling the cops on me. I had four cops in my living room. Yeah. <laughs> and, oh, you, you but, go to that dark place. No, I got, yeah, I got exactly. You. I, it's, I, 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 I know. There's no graduation. He goes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, oh, shit. But, you know, that's, that, I'm glad because I know there's guys out there and even myself. I've been, I've been in the, I've done the best crying game imitation in the shower, all huddled up in the corner yeah. feeling like a piece of shit because I, I felt like I couldn't over all this shit I've overcome and I can't overcome a mistake I made in yeah. my life, or I just don't want to live anymore. So I, I get it saying stuff like that, bro. I tell you, it helps. And obviously you came out of it, but that's, that's how we always learn. And that's how us knuckleheads and our knuckle draggers have to learn. We have to do something stupid or something that's a mistake and learn, okay, right. that was a freaking mistake. What do I need to do to overcome it? But that's what makes you who you are is, is you figured it out. You know, I try to lead by example. And, and, and yeah. my example is trying to get as much of my journey to the finding peace, to find the understanding, um, get that out there as much as possible. Hopefully somebody else will pick up on it and it can make their lives better. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. You, you guys are both very indicative of that, that you could really turn things around. I mean, I've been referencing it. I think the past couple shows, just because it's been on my mind, I've been, I just completed Jim West's audio book, Green Beret. And I mean, at the very end of the book, which I just finished reading yesterday, is where he talks about his oldest son getting shot in the back of the head. And the reason that, I mean, more than anything, why this really weighed on Jim is Jim is like, I devoted my entire life to self-defense. One thing I always said to my son is never, you know, never let your, your guard down from behind. And sure enough, that's how he dies. And it weighed on Jim for years. Mm -hmm. Now, the fact that like we have Jim on the podcast and he's the, he always has a smile He's always in a great mood. Like, it's so, it's just such exemplary to me 
that you could turn anything around. You just got to stick it through. Yep. And for you, it was it was writing this book and putting that those thoughts to, to paper and saying, this is what I went through. And and it's going to help other people out. Yeah, I definitely hope so. And, and most of the guys we've had on, brother, and he, it, you know, whether it, it, uh, uh, the, the veterans that are authors, uh, a lot of them have done that, where they, they put the pen to paper. And and that's how they've overcome whether it's whether it's like Luke Luke uh, little Opie coming Opie Cunningham writing poetry, or or you know like yourself writing a full book or or me even writing a couple you know, I, <laughs> and and it, it did help it, it immensely helped you just I want to tell guys if you're gonna do that you're a veteran get over yourself first of all get over yourself right it's okay to put it on paper there's nothing wrong with it if there's always gonna be somebody oh look at what he's writing well so what if it helps you it doesn't matter and it's gonna help somebody else. Um, I, and obviously you're, you are, uh, my question on this, and this is why I never, I never knew I as to the job. How did you figure out that job or did you go with that MO or was it 11 oh. bang bang? Was it 11 Bravo MOS that you I went was, in? I was an 0311. I was an 0311. Oh, oh, you? So I ended up, um, uh, being a Marine reservist. Um, I, I know. I'll say 0311 is for all you army guys out there. That's 11 Bravo. So just so <laughs> we all we're infantry. Got it. Okay. I just yeah, want to make I, sure that we we, we got figured out. I was a uh, Marine reservist. Uh, I, my dad was the Air Force, so I grew up all over the world. You know, Japan, been to Thailand, Philippines when I was a kid, and stuff all over the states. And so um, I didn't want to travel, but I wanted to serve because I, I I've spent my entire life never knowing what exactly a home was. So um, I went to high school and then I joined the reserves. And then um, the closest unit to my home was a military police company, uh, Charlie, up in Dayton, Ohio. And um, they were like, okay, we can accept 0311s or grunts over here in, in our unit because we have an experimental group called Greg's Registration. And since you're close to your, your house and, you know, we'll accept you. And I thought, eh, well... Why not? Because uh, my car sucks and, yeah. and uh, it's close <laughs> yeah. and we'll, and this is right after the Gulf War. So okay. um, this is 1993 that I reported into that unit. And I thought you look super young, bro. I, know, I would I never think 1993. <laughs> yeah, you, you're wow. that, that oil of LA has worked that's, well yeah, for my you. Mom's, bro. <laughs> uh, my mom's from Thailand. So I get that. I got the Asian you get blood, the you know. That's true. I'll get carded. So. <laughs> but yeah, I reported in and um, and uh, they were like, do you know what we do? I'm like, no, what exactly do we, do? what do you do? It was like, well, in war, you go find dead guys and you bring them home. And I was like, I really didn't want to do that. I wanted to be a grunt. I want to go yeah. shoot guns, blow things up and, you know, go on, on, on patrols and stuff. But uh, the longer I stayed in the unit, the, the more friends I made, and uh, um, I liked the idea of what the lieutenant colonel had had thought of more, uh, Greg's registration was back then was uh, grunts being able to provide your own security, yeah, going on a patrols recovery, and the whole idea was like, um, like down birds that kind of stuff. And then when Somalia happened, and I saw what had happened there. Um, where they were bringing guys to the street, dragging guys to the streets and yeah. stuff. And I was like, you know, at least I, here I am in a position where we would be help, helping to go get those guys out. We can. So you, you'd be part of a CSAR, you'd be part of combat search and rescue teams? Oh, uh, we won't be a uh, rescue, mission? we'd be recovery. Recovery. Okay, right. gotcha. So gotcha. I was thinking I could help do something with that, with having the, uh, the, the grunt side and the mortuary affairs side. So we ended up going through and eventually I stayed there for so long. Um, 9-11 happened and then I knew I was going into combat at some point because we were the only mortuary affairs unit in the entire Marine Corps. Um, okay. Active duty reserves or whatever. And at the time there was like 33 of us, 33, 35 of us in the entire Marine Corps has ever been to the school. So which is an army school at Fort Lee, Virginia. And so 9-11 uh, happened. We never got to go to uh, Afghanistan. Yeah. And then we started hearing rumblings up in 2002 that we might be heading to um, Iraq. Uh, so we prepared for it, you know, they, how to teach the job. Because, uh, like I said, there's only 33 of us that yeah. did it at the time. So we, uh, 
they were like, all right, go train two other companies, one in Marietta, Georgia, and one in, in uh, Anacostia Navy Yards in, in Washington, D.C. So we were able to beef up the knowledge base from 33 to over 300 uh, before we pumped out. But I didn't choose it. I didn't choose it. No, it was like weighing, you know, rolling the dice. And are we going to ever go to war? Because I really don't want to do this in war. And then by the time we were actually heading to a conflict, I was one of the most senior guys who you knew how to do the job in, in the Marine Corps. So I, I was like, why not? But I didn't really know exactly what war was like um, and what we would see. And I was thinking it would be like the Gulf War where it was over really fast, uh, light casualties. And, and um, that's how it was during the invasion. I thought, yeah. hey, this was actually pretty cool. We get to go over here, do a job. Um, and get these guys home. Um, but to me, it was, it, we didn't start to take any casualties. So to me, the, my, the first push into Iraq was kind of like, this is a really cool job. And, and, and re- I'm, I'm sitting here in my vehicle watching history play out before me. Oh, you are, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, I, I remember seeing the very first impacts of the the air campaign when I was right there on the on the border, uh, dug in on holes, and the very first uh, uh, artillery rounds being shot out at Safwan Hill as we were crossing through the breach. That's uh, cool, and I, and I that I think that is cool. I don't care what people that that's that's history. That's making right. history. So, right uh, now, but or, I, I for being part of it, I didn't choose the job. <laughs> yeah, uh, did, now, do they have an? Is there an MOS or yeah. a, a job a job indicator in the Navy or the Marine Corps? Um, or is it Navy and then it's a or a Marine Corps? Yeah, back you, uh, when I first joined that. up, it was called uh, ninety fifty one. Was okay. was the MOS uh, designator, and it was called Graves <clears throat> Registration. And that Graves, goes. Graves yeah, that's, that okay. goes back to the old school, like World War Two. Yeah, Radio World War Two. Yep. And well, that idea is to, is that we were supposed to, like in World War II, be able to plot graves, build cemeteries, and oh, okay. and inter people there. Because like if you go to ever go to Normandy, yeah, you got yep. the big you know, cemetery there, mm-hmm. and um, over at like Flanders Fields, you know, all the stuff there in Belgium. Well, that's what my job was supposed to do. And later on, be okay. able to extract those remains and bring them home after so many years and stuff. So um, during the 90s and the Clinton years, they ended up changing the job from uh, mortu- from graves registration to mortuary affairs because they were downsizing. And they wanted to keep the whole MOS intact and sexier streamline it you know so they made the thing mortuary affairs so um it moved on to uh to that until we did our first two deployments and on my third deployment they moved it over to prp which is personnel retrieval and processing okay so in what it is is that we were the guys be able to go out on the scene recover um and re uh, and to evacuate the remains that came to us and be able to evacuate the personal effects that he had on him at you know, at the time of that at the time but we didn't want to be the big logistics group with having all of his stuff we wanted that to be left up to the uh the actual units to be able to send it to their own chain sure because we didn't sure. we you know in the marine corps we're small there's only a few yeah, uh, you know, two units of us left, and we didn't want to take all. You know, did a huge. That's just manpower we could be using towards recovering guys and getting them home. Well, and, and, and you know, you want to give it to the unit because they knew that they knew their own, right? And that's going to mean more to the family to have the unit present if they if they're able to. If it doesn't get into the higher chains where they start making the political decisions of who's going to shake their family's hands or hand them the flag or so. But the unit needs that. The unit needs that closure because the unit is a family. Yep. And they definitely have to. Yeah. So I, I agree with that. You're giving it to the unit and saying, okay, guys, we did everything we can. Now here, you guys take it from here. Here's the handoff. And no, that, that's, that's, I, that's smart. Yep. Um, completely. Now talk about if you can, um, we talked about the service, how to go in and what you've done. You know, we, we, we get a lot of listeners and because my wife is very supportive of me, she's been on the show before. Can you talk about maybe if there's guys out there that are going through issues with families because mm-hmm. their families don't understand. We touched on it a little bit already. 
maybe go into how did you, how did that with your wife, when she started to realize what you had gone through, what transpired after that? And how did you continue to stay on that positive road also? And you have, and again, I forgive me if I can't remember if you have kids. Or yes, not. I have, uh, have a 20 year old, uh, and, yeah. <laughs> And uh, twenty-year-old daughter is going to uh, school, and then I have a, a nine-year-old daughter. Well, I, and you know how how the family life adjusted, or how you adjusted with, the, and how you brought them up to speed, and 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 how you continue to live. Because I know I know you live a happy life uh, right now. How does that continue? What what do guys need to do? I just can you give them a play? I really so, hey, don't guys, think that there's like a magic answer. You know, a a silver bullet that helps everybody because uh, everybody has different dynamics. Sure. Um, you know, some of their wives work, some of their wives don't, you know, and uh, the relationships are built upon different things. Um, I'm lucky where I have my wife who who came from a solid family structure and and their thing was never to give up on the family. And I've, I've seen a lot of people who who as soon as they have their a little fight, they're like, you know, hell with you. I'm leaving and stuff. And, and so um it's work, man. Right, it's it work. Is. It, it, <laughs> it's work. It is. It's a lot of work. And my wife was very, you know, I don't deserve her because she she has been through hell with me. And, you know, I thought that the worst part of of, of the most difficult part about the uh, our you know, experience, our relationship is when I was deployed. She was always left in the dark, never knowing exactly where I was. I couldn't tell her anything. Um, and she says, no, the hardest part was when you came home and dealing with all of the, all the leftovers and not knowing where to help, how to help and who can help mm -hmm. her. And um, I was really lucky with having a, getting a uh, therapist that I trusted. He served over there in Iraq a as well. He traveled some of the same roads. And uh, finally, I, did, I had somebody I could talk about, um, you know, ex tell about, hey, you know, IED got me on this day. And I didn't have, didn't have to explain what an IED was, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, or talk to somebody who uh, is supposed to be an hour and a half session. And after 40 minutes, they said they were done. You know, because uh, they couldn't Last handle, it, you know, what I was talking about. Um, wow. So, but what what really helped me was that not only did that therapist was able to open, he had his open door policy, twenty four hours a day, seven days a, a week with me. He also had it with her as well, so she can call anytime. Um, also, that there's a lot of times where I was struggling, like uh, anniversary dates. Or um, like I, things would be in my mind where I'd see roadkill in the road. And next thing you know, my mind's doing this thing. And all of a sudden I'm hitting rock bottom. And so my wife was able to come into uh, my therapy sessions with me. And so she would get a frame of reference. And so it wasn't where it was my battle and she was looking from the outside. It was our battle and that she was vested in me and in our relationship. Yeah. And I was totally honest and open with her and I didn't want to have it where, you know, that I wanted to let her understand as much as she could possibly understand. And that's where the writing came in. And then she was able to understand that because reading and putting herself in those situations, because the way that I write is the, as, as if I'm living it again, you know, um, using the five senses, you know, what it smelt like, what it tastes like, you know, you know, getting that, that sweat in your eyes and all the bugs calling in your ears and stuff and, and still looking for that bad guy that, you know, is watching you. And so, you know, I, I, wrote that out there and so she was able to read and understand that hey you know this stuff is is you know reason why he's having problems so she became um somebody who became more i hate to say the word chaperone but, you know, well but aren't our wives yeah. our wives are chaperones come on don't, don't she's my but, chaperone too I go like, out into public <laughs> and so if somebody is kind of irking me she can yeah. create that distance 
Yeah, yeah, no. You yeah. know, uh, yeah, or right. yeah. she even notices things that I do before I even notice that I'm doing it. And she was like, okay, well, let's go ahead and back up away from here. You know, um, so she's and and so she calls herself my service dog. <laughs> you know? that's a, yeah, actually, yeah, that's true. It's but good. my wife does that. Too. I, I agree. When, when somebody comes up and talks to me when we're traveling, and yeah, she will. She'll start to move in because it's hard for me to not want to. If somebody comes to me and says, "Hey, are you? Hey, what happened here? What do you think about this?" and I'll start talking and and eventually i may go down a rabbit hole and she'll see it and she'll step yeah, in yeah. say oh yeah we, we got to start moving and, we, and she does it eloquently a lot better than i could ever do it and no that's exactly that's the, you you got a good woman there yeah? exactly and, and she she takes care of, and that that i i always say that as well to to guys if you're having issues look at home i ask are you married yeah are you married okay look at home first you got to get that established and you have to listen to your wife you have to treat her well because she's the one that's going to get you through the hard stuff if you don't have a good relationship at home chances are that's nine percent of where the pain and turmoil and all those dark holes you're going down is stemming from is because you don't have a good relationship at home and you have to get that so i and i i, I completely agree with you brother and, and my wife's the same way exactly the same now way. with so, my my well older daughter you know, um, I feel sorry for her for having to live through some of the stuff that, that you know, for, with my recovery and seeing um, me drinking so much and, and just bawling my eyes out and, you know, stuff like that. And uh, she, she knows about creating that distance as well. Um, she accepts it for, you know, what it is. She may not totally understand it. She may not want to totally understand it, but I think she's, you know, my experience has really turned her off about ever joining the military. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say, I would say so. But, I, I, did you have to, me and my 15 year old, he's 16 now. Actually, I was gone for pretty much till he was eight. And, you know, I, I came home for two weeks when he was born. And then I was gone again for another nine months and I came back for a month and I was gone for another six. So even it, it, it now that I've been home more over the last two years, um, I actually have had to learn. We've had to learn to, to be father and son. Yeah. I hate to say, but we are the five-year-old. I have a five-year-old and no, that's part I'm actually living like a father should to his five-year-old. Has your have you come around with your daughter? Did you or and did you have to go through things like I did, where you had to learn really how to be a father and a daughter? I was. I, we really did. Yeah. We did at first, you know, because um, my first deployment, uh, my daughter was two, and yeah, then yeah. <clears throat> I came back home, and then as soon as I came back home, um, I volunteered to go back over, and that's when I was with uh, uh, an infantry unit, and that's when I got blown up. So. Uh, spent some time in the hospital and I came back home in, um, Oh four, went volunteered in Oh five. And when I came back in Oh six, um, my daughter, I remember, um, I was reaching out to the, the holder and she didn't want to hold you know, me to hold her and she just wanted mommy. And I realized that she didn't know who daddy was, that yeah. daddy was a picture on the mantle and not a real living, breathing person. And so we spent that whole summer afterwards trying to reconnect. And, and um, that's one reason why with my younger daughter, I try to really overdo things, you know, try yeah. to be there for her <laughs> as much as possible. Yeah. You know, my thing also with, with my recovery is um, I didn't want my my troubles, my sins, my things that I've had to deal with to be a factor in why their lives were jacked up. You no, know, sure. I didn't want to say that, you know, them to grow up and say, my my father had this, he had PTSD, that's the reason why I have to do drugs or be in bad relationships or, you know, uh, you know, make an excuse for their lives. I want to give them all the tools and and, and all the understanding and love that they can be able to uh, live long, full, productive lives without me, uh, without my stuff being an influence on yeah. their, you know, successes or failures. Yeah. And that really mm -hmm. happens. Yeah. Um, you know what I wanted to ask you about? It's, it, you know, forgive me on this one, because I think it's been a couple of years yeah. since I actually spoke to you. So it's a little <laughs> bit blurry. 
if I rem if I remember correctly, were you involved with the um, flag yep. folding and all that for the guys that Chris served within Benghazi? Yeah, I, we actually we I I knew we just I guess I just didn't. Yeah, tell me. Um, what, tell me what and and what and what did you say? And it, whether it's politically overtoned or not, we don't you know we don't really get into politics on this. But the truth's the truth. Yes. So if you saw something that, and we'll talk about it on the show right now, if you saw something that I need to know, and I I know because because I know a lot of shitty shit was going on on this yep. on in the United States and in Germany when we flew to Germany as well. So I, I would love to know. I'm always putting pieces together of what actually took place, why we were actually left, what was going on here. And, and it's just from like persons like yourself that actually went through it. Not the media, not somebody heard something from somebody that talked to their dog that told them something from some <laughs> other dog. It was like, hey, this is where I was. This is what happened. So yeah, please yeah. tell me because I, I'd like yeah, to, I, 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 cause I don't, yeah, know I don't know anything about, you know, um, Libya or anything like that. Um, I don't know, um, exactly how they, they got, um, your, your brother's home on that. But, um, back in 2005 on my third deployment, we were, we are starting to do a, um, Riptoa. We're replacing the other people who yeah. was doing the job yep. and so you do left seat right seat um uh, first week we watch them second week we they watch us do the job yep. and and so you have a seamless transition there so uh the very first day we get there and there was a um, um army major had gotten killed that morning and um i noticed that when they went to flag his transfer case his transfer case is the mobile air coffin the, the yeah ship him yep. home so what they did, and it's no fault to the, the team that we were replacing, it's just the way it's always been done. So they ended up taking this uh, American flag straight out of the cardboard box. It was just, you know, like a little box like that. Yeah. And they just put it out on top of the transfer case and tied a white cord around it. So you could see the you seams see the and everything. Seams. Oh, you could see the fold. And wow. You could the folds. You could see and, the little, uh, wow. um, little strings. Yeah, the creases. The creases, the strings from it yep. being in the box, yep. you know, that they didn't dust off. And the white cord. And I thought that was totally jacked up because, you know, I grew up in the military. Um, my dad served three tours. I'm sorry about that thing going off, dinging. Because it's always oh, no, we, we're, 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 oh, we're really? here anyway. my, my little, it, it yeah, me. I can't hear. I can't we're, you're figure good. out how to you're turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, my you know, my dad served three tours in Vietnam. He talked about you know uh, some of the guys that he knew uh, who who uh, who uh, died over there. So that was always cognizant on my mind. Um, and so being in mortuary affairs, I um, uh, all through the '90s, I did a lot of of uh, funeral details. And going all the way up to this point in 2004, when I was with Third Battalion, Fourth Marines, a lot of the guys after I got blown up went into Fallujah for for Vigilant Resolve for the first push into Fallujah, and yep. a lot of guys yep. that I had met had gotten killed uh, uh, during that in during that uh, that battle. And so after I had my surgeries, convalescent leave, I went back, and so we ended up sitting around with other guys who got wounded, and we were talking about how, how they got hit and, and, and stuff. So I kind of internalized all that stuff. And fast forward to 2005, I'm replacing these guys and I saw how they were putting the flag on the transfer cases. And I thought that was totally messed up that yeah. these guys go over to do um, what America asked them to do. And they're being sent home in a fashion that was undeserving of that. I thought uh, of, of, of somebody who sacrificed their lives for in the name of freedom, right? For for all yep. of us, um, and and so I know it wasn't the fault of anybody. It's just the way it's always been done. So um, me overthinking things, you know, I went down and I I went down to the PX and they had one can of starch, one iron, one ironing board. <laughs> And the stuff was in there for so long. They had like a thick film of dust, like greasy dust on it. Yeah. And so, yeah, I take it. I wipe it all off, take it up and buy it. And I'd go back the next day. There'd be two cans of starch. So I buy those, then four, then, you know, it would just double yeah. and double and double up. So um, one day 
uh, I'm down there with one of my gunnery sergeants, and um, it's a fly on the freaking camera. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but he's. Uh, uh, I was like, "Hey, Gunny, can you come with me? And, and I need some help carrying some boxes." He goes, "Absolutely." He goes down there, and the lady asked me. He goes, uh, "She's like." So what are you doing with all these cans of starch? You know, you're not supposed to be using starch over here in combat. And uh, nobody's trying to look good for the enemy, you know. So uh, I was like, man, we're <laughs> I'm ironing and starching every American flag that we get before we put them on the transfer cases. So um, I, I started that up. And before that, um, nobody was ever ironing and starching flags. Um, we came up with a fold that... And we would tie the white cord around first with two slip knots, two fishing knots. Mm -hmm. And so um, then we tuck it underneath on the sides and on the ends, we tuck it in and we pull it and make sure there's no, no uh, strings that are hanging off anywhere. Make sure there's not a speck of dust on there. And we ironed it so much that it looked like it gleamed in the light. So um, years go by, um, we did all of our remains that way. Um, even when we were in combat, we would have the, uh, the, the C-130 flying around picking up all the remains. And he yeah. would get to our base, and uh, the captain of the, the bird was like, don't take this the wrong way. But we like picking up uh, remains that you guys do because you could see you go through that extra step that, that nobody else is doing. Um, yeah. so fast forward to 2009, I get a phone call from one of my buddies and he was like, Hey, uh, Brigadier General so-and-so was over in, in, uh, Ramstein and uh, he was yeah. back here for a, a, a ramp ceremony, him and his entourage. He goes, the first one that came off was done the old style. The second one that comes off is done the, uh, the old style. He goes, the third one comes off and it's done your style. And he goes, damn it. I know Marines did that. So uh, he goes, he calls up my chief warrant officer and she goes, yes, sir. That's the, that's the bustler method. You know, he's did that back in 2005. We, we adopted it. The Marine Corps does it for everybody that we handle. And, um, and he goes from now on until the end of the Marine Corps, when the, when the country no longer needs a Marine Corps, um, everyone that we do will come home in this fashion. So um, it was adopted. And it, the day that, um, your uh your brother came home yeah. has done that style um, so did did you did you did you go to germany and do no, it there I we, we i didn't go to germany. okay so so you got it taken care of when they got back to um do was it dover I, and again I, we were still we were still stuck so, in, um, in those Ramp guys I um i don't know how <laughs> where where your guys had went to they might have went straight up to germany and i i know that some marines that were going back and forth from, from the other units were working over there for, so and, they and so did. I don't know if they we, did it. I can't tell. I, I th I'm pretty, we, now we escorted them. Cause I remember escorting them from Tripoli to, cause we loaded the coffins on and, and we loaded the flat, the, 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 the transfer cases. I, I still call them coffins. Yeah. Um, and the, uh, and the flags on them. I remember cause we sat, I sat by, you know, I sat right next to him the whole flight. But then when we got to Germany, it was turned over to the mortuary affairs. Mortuary affairs. Yeah. yeah. And that's where I just, I, after that, and after that too, since we were agency personnel and we were the only agency personnel that they had on the plane there, they kept everybody else and Tripoli so they could fly Petraeus over and yeah. they could feed him a bunch of bullshit without the guys that were actually fighting that night there. But we kind of got general ham came on the plane, came on our bus and we got off the plane and said, okay, guys, you guys are over here. And all the state department people went that way. So, after that, I mean, we just kind of went into hiding and I didn't see anything else for a week because we weren't part of State Department. Right. So I but I, yeah, that's why I, I know that I know they were handled with respect because I saw some of the pictures and they looked fine. It looked good. I just I, I always like to hear other portions right. of the stories because of, of, I, I want to know what happened from the guys on the ground. And even those little stories there give me an idea of how it was treated and how the story was being treated and how the families were treated because I still am friends with, with Cheryl, with Ty's mom. I'm still in friends with Sean Smith's mom, Pat. In fact, I just talked to Cheryl. I uh, got an email from her last week and I want, they don't know. 
they have no idea how their really how their sons were treated, except from what we tell right. them, what we know. So, so giving information from you is great because then I can go back to Cheryl or Charles Woods or Pat mm -hmm. Smith. A, or 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 Bub's sister. Um, I'm forgetting her name. She's she's actually a good friend of mine. Um, Kate, Kate Quigley, Katie, right? Yeah, Katie Quigley, and say, guys, this is this is they were treated with respect. Right. It, it it is. It just it gives them closure. So I appreciate you. Any information you ever know, please hit me up on a text. Absolutely. And say, hey, Chris, this is this is what I heard, and then I can pass. Okay, it on I can I can ask around because you know I, I know a lot yeah, of people I appreciate in this it, community. Brother. But, um, yeah, the reason why I ended up folding the flag like that is because um, the, the way that they did it before, uh, the flag was in danger of touching the ground. And I did not want to do anything to tarnish the, the honor, respect, and the service of this uh, individual who had, who had uh, lost their lives in service to our country. So, um, yeah, that's, I'm glad that it's, it's now – uh, adopted, adopted and, yeah. and my little yeah. my little mark on history and stuff you know but uh, <laughs> the bustler method bustler. i love it man <laughs> and well that's that's what's awesome about you talking about this because you the flag has become a political oh, yeah. statement and it's into guys like yourself myself millions of uh, uh you know i say million well over the years yes but soldiers and airmen and seamen and and coast guardies and it, it's not political. Right. It shouldn't be. It should actually be. It's it's it represents everyone in this country and those that have sacrificed, given everything for this country. It it's for them. It's it's not a, it's not. You should be at a political statement or a political, a political symbol. It's not. It's sacred. To all of us, to this collective idea of of liberty, freedom. I mean, I, I think this is just such an important story. And it's funny Chris said this because I the same exact thing, honestly, was going through my head as you're discussing this. And, and I think the problem in America today is, yeah, I, I do really do think people need to hear your story because I think people yeah. just being told, you better stand for the flag, <laughs> it doesn't really resonate doesn't with them. Resonate. And the problem yeah. is we have an all-voluntary military. So we yep. have one to two percent, I think, of people, maybe less than that, who even serve. So there's people all over the country who don't know anyone who served. Oh, yeah. I was thinking about this this morning as I was going through a walk and thinking that we were going to do this interview. We haven't had a commander in chief who's had any service since George H.W. Bush. And yeah, yeah. A, a lot of kids today wouldn't even, you know, they weren't alive when George H.W. Bush was in office. He wasn't, that was 1988 to 1992. So I, I do think there's a reason that respect is not there. And I think if people heard your story, they would go, oh, I think at least some people would say, okay, it clicks now. I get why we stand right. for this. I get, and I get why some of us get offended by it, even though I never served under political, uh, political ideologies. I never went over as a military uh, in the army or a contractor because of politics. I went over because I wanted to serve. I wanted to do the job. Right. I wanted to, I, I was proud, and I still am proud to be an American and proud to protect. And you do. You feel like you're protecting freedoms. And, and I'm not going to lie to you. I enjoyed it, too. Ian and I have had this conversation. I love doing what I was doing. I, I don't, I'm not going to say I didn't. Um, but it got people, it, the, the flag, and the flag was always the symbol of that. And being in countries and seeing it up in the air yeah. in other countries always made you feel proud. But also, man, I mean, we're, it made you feel like you're at home. It, it brought those, I'm still home. You know, going to a consulate and seeing it up, up, going to a base and seeing it up in the air. You look at it and you're like, man, that, that thing's awesome. It, it, it's, I love being here. I love serving my country. And to have it, have it utilized as a political symbol for either side, I think Sully's what this flag really means for us. And your story, just what you said, mm -hmm. man, that, that hits home because you have more experience with that flag and what it really means for service members and what it should mean for everybody in this country than any of us. Cause, and, and you got the bustler method. I mean, yep. you got this shit, you got the method named after you <laughs> and you treat it with respect. And that's, that gives me chills. It does. It gives me chills down my spine. I, you, I would love it. If you if, have uh, attention to you detail, know, more people would hear about this story. It's not, like I said, it's not a average military story. Yeah. It's a story of, of, uh, it's a human story. It's a military, but it's also a human story of trying to get this, 
um, to honor the guys who had gone forth to do what their country had asked them to do. Uh, all politics aside, you know, when when you're out there on the ground, boots, the politics is a million miles away. A million miles you're away. Just, <laughs> you're just trying to get the job done and bring all your guys home with yeah. all their fingers and toes, and and uh, and that's it, you know, and and be able to go home. Do do you when you got off the plane? I, I always. And I, I talk, I've talked about this on shows before. I've written about it in books, in my other books. But when you served and when you got off the plane, when you stepped on U.S. soil, th- my feeling was I, I always just, I always felt like I was coming back to Disney. It's like the first time going to Disneyland. You got off, you, you're out of Iraq, you're out of Libya, you're Afghanistan. You step off the plane and you're like in Chicago, or you're, or you're flying onto a base. Maybe you're flying into Dover, or you're flying over into Andrews. Or, mm-hmm. But you get on American soil. And every time, every time, over a 10-year period, every time I stepped off a plane and got on American soil, I felt like, man, I'm back in Disneyland again. This is awesome. <laughs> but I don't know if you had the same feelings when, when you got back over – because I know you did multiple trips. What did you feel? Or did you not feel uh, at all? And you just the like, first I'm time, I was thankful of being home. Um, I remember – now, the, the thermometer they had after we did our our rotation, rotation yeah, and yeah. Uh, they brought us back down to Kuwait and he sat us down for two or three months. Yeah. And the, the, the thermometer they had was sitting in the sun. So, but it said, it read 143 degrees. <laughs> oh, I don't know if how accurate, but it read 143 degrees because that was showing everybody. And they had no <laughs> air conditioners. So I was, we we're pounding water that's been sitting in the sun all day. Oh, yeah, that's great. My getting, all normal, that, getting all that plastic in you. Yeah, that's great, too. Although all the uh, – <laughs> my normal weight before was – I was, what, 165? I came home at 134 because, Damn, yeah, man. I lost so much weight. And so coming home, uh, I was happy to get a glass full of ice, you know, <laughs> and to turn on the air conditioner and <laughs> sit in front of it. And, you know, I was happy to just do that stuff. And and I wanted to try to connect with my daughter as much sure. as I could. Yeah. Um, and and um, my my second trip, I felt like I would just came home from an like an accident. Like, you know, um, my body you still, still hurt. And, and you I was trauma, like, you I was trauma, like trauma going? wow, that shit was crazy. You know, like. <laughs> Yeah. I should be yeah. dead, but thank God I'm not. But that was crazy, you know. And I, I come home, and I was one of the few guys from from my my particular unit to volunteer to go back to go over on my my mm-hmm. deployment. So when I got hurt, they had a big welcoming home party for me and stuff. A lot of the guys I served with in OIF one had, had uh, you know come out and stuff, and it was really cool to see them. And, and and get all the well wishes. I just wanted a quiet night. And next thing you know, we're having a party. And and uh, so it was kind of surreal. But my third trip, the whole time on my third trip coming home, um, I felt like I was in a dream. Like this wasn't real. I'm going to wake up and I'm still going to be back in September. And I got to do this whole deployment over again. Sure. That, um, that was, it was such a bad deployment i mean your brain your brain had had enough i mean your your brain had gone through enough at that point it's just you were overloaded yeah yeah it sounds like both of you guys kind of knew when you were like ready to tap out i mean you more with contracting but right well i i i mean i i i, I would still be doing it if i wasn't forced to <laughs> forced to tap out i i would still be doing it now i'm too damn old but i probably would have done it a few more years del comstock's I, I, older than you and he's still no, doing he's, it but, no, but i think, I, he, I I think never... he loves it man i don't you know what you know what i wanted to mention to you guys because you were describing the flag thing and, and just to get back to that for a second did either of you by any chance see the speech that gene simmons gave at the white house like a year ago gene no. Simmons from kiss dude it was awesome and and it's it's funny because people were um you know critical because they're like why is Gene Simmons from Kiss speaking at the White House there are people you know why not, not? Talk, well and also it's I not know. like he went to talk about uh you know Kiss being on their last tour or something he gave an amazing speech about his mom being a Holocaust survivor him coming to America and what the flag means to him and it's like hearing those stories from you hearing that stuff from Gene Simmons it was like I'm gonna see if I could pull it up real quick because okay. genuinely it was like one of the best speeches. I, I ever heard, and it was about what the flag sta- means to him, why the flag is so important, and it's just whether I'm hearing from you, I think people need to hear these. 
it's not about just you better stand for the flag because right. you do, Chris, as Chris says, you do have the freedom to not stand for it. Yeah. But I think if people realized what it meant, yeah. something would click for, for some of these people who don't have friends, don't have family who's ever served. Um, I'm going to see if I could pull it up, but it was, okay. it was great. I was born in Israel. I know I don't look Swiss. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I am a, a proud son of a concentration camp survivor of Nazi Germany. My mother was 14 when she was in the camps. Uh, we're I'm measuring my words because I'm about to break up again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and again, my mother just passed at 93. But almost there, 10 seconds control. <laughs> If Americans could see and hear my mother, <clears throat> almost there, talk about America, they would understand. And uh, I'll just cut to the chase. When, when we first came to America, my mother let me stay up and watch TV with her, and I couldn't speak English very well. <clears throat> and my mother could barely get by. She worked six days a week, and at night, we would watch the news and whatever, and by 12 o'clock, the three or four TV stations would go off the air, and you would hear this kind of just noise, and people presumably would go to sleep. Before then, we saw a jet flying through the sky, on TV, a jet flying through the sky, and a man in a very deep voice was saying something I couldn't understand it and the jet then turned skyward and flew seemingly into the heavens through the clouds and I remember what the man said and saw the face of God and then it, it melted into the a black and white because in those days we didn't have color TV the flag was full screen billowing and I heard, da, 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 you know, the, the national anthem, and I didn't know what it was or what was going on, and it was almost time to go to sleep. It was late, and every time, uh, every time my mother saw the flag, she'd start crying. As an eight-year-old boy, I didn't understand why. But from my mother's point of view, we were finally safe. I may, <clears throat> I may have been born in the country, everybody. Give me two seconds. I may have been born in the country that people throughout history have referred to as the promised land, but take my word for it. America is the promised land for everybody. And don't be ashamed, don't hesitate. <clears throat> we need to teach young people to be comfortable with saying, God bless America. End of my story. Yeah, that just, I, and I hope it, you know, hit you guys. But when I heard that, I mean, it's just, you don't hear those stories enough uh, to me, I think. Of and coming from someone that's, I, I, I think sometimes the people that, that are on the other side of, and I have, there are sides here as far as whether they respect the flag or not. Um, I think when it comes from somebody other than a, a veteran or a soldier, I, honestly, I think they listen more. Sometimes they'll come, it'll come from a veteran. I've seen it where people, it's almost like an eye roll. It's like, oh yeah, we get it guys. We get it. You love the flag. Well, the story that, that the bustler method and, <laughs> and Christian said, they understand why, but when you have people like Gene Simmons and, and that's why they are public figures and they do have influence when it comes from somebody like that, it, it does resonate. And sometimes it, it reaches 
people that we can't reach. I, we love to say that soldiers and veterans can reach everybody, but we, we can't. And, and and a lot of that has to do with political reasons or where veterans sometimes lie. And they see that where we've been stereotyped. Hey, we're always going to be Republican. We're always going right. to, we're always, we love, we love everything Republican. We hate everything. And but you know what, you know the what the truth is though? I mean, survey after survey has shown that you guys as service members are way more respected in the public eye than politicians, than Those, any of the, damn and well it, should it's be. true. Yeah, no, but, <laughs> but it's, it's the truth. I, and I think maybe sometimes you guys forget that, that I think this country really does, at least most of us love its veterans. Unfortunately, as we've seen with all the politi politicization going on, police officers, not the most popular right now. And that's just the truth. But I think you guys actually do have a lot of sway over the public. And, well, and, and I think it's a good thing. Well, that, and, and Christian, you have way your two cents in here. Which I know you. we have a new on the podcast in here, me and Ian. Are, <laughs> <laughs> hey, you, you just stay over there. We're going to talk amongst ourselves for a little bit. We'll get right back to you. <laughs> Stop it. Oh, I felt so comfortable again. I looked right in your eyes again. <laughs> so, but uh, you know, you know, for your little bit here, in your your gut, what what do you what do you think? And, and you again, with everybody that I've known or I've talked to via the podcast, do you have the most experience on dealing uh, and handling, uh, respectfully handling the flag um, on an everyday basis? So, I, I your opinion matters to me. Whether it matters to anybody else out there, you can guys can go to hell. If it doesn't matter to you, <laughs> but it matters to me. So, I, I'd like to know, and I want to know what you think. I've um, my story is a little, it's a little bit different than most of the average Americans because you know, yeah, I I grew up in a military family who's my grandfather fought in World War II with General MacArthur. Um, my granduncle wow. uh, landed at Omaha Beach, uh, was wounded in a, in, well, he got evacuated with trench foot in Bastogne. And, um, wow. and so he yeah. just passed away like two years ago. Um, so my dad did three tours in, in the Vietnam War um, where he met and married my mom. And so my mom's an immigrant. And um, I grew up looking across the fence and seeing the Japanese flag or the Filipino flag, seeing people living in, in, in slums in, in the Philippines during yeah. back when uh, Marcos was, in, uh, was yeah. in power. You know, same thing in Thailand uh, before we came here to the United States. Um, I grew up, you know, believing that the United States is something good. It is something um that is the champion for freedom it is the it is something that like ronald reagan said is the last bastion of of hope and freedom because without us where is where does everybody else go um and yeah. and i seen it from joining into uh the reserves and doing hundred literally hundreds of funerals I volunteered to do funerals before they even started paying us because that was my way of honoring those who had come before us. Um, I've done funerals from anywhere from Vietnam War veterans to the veterans who fought in the Chosen Reservoir in the Korean War wow. to Iwo Jima um, uh, veterans and stuff. Um, one kid who came home uh, to surprise his mom and dad uh, yeah, it surprises mom and dad for Christmas, and he goes to a bar, and somebody um, puts him his head in the headlock and puts a pistol to his ear. So the um, we did his funeral, and there was a slow march of the Marines hymn as we were in there, and stuff that really tear jerks you, and, and you see how much that hy that hymn meant to, and, and that flag draped yeah. casket meant to that family. Um, and uh, to fast forward to see combat for the very first time and going past uh, as we initially invaded Iraq and seeing the Shias uh, down in Southern Iraq waving us in and then knowing that just back in the early nineties, Saddam Hussein tried to wipe them off the face of the earth um, when they rebelled and when he uh, rerouted the Tigris and Euphrates rivers away from the homeland and so now I remember seeing this little girl who had uh, 
pink ruffled shirt, you know, like a dress with white lace and, and white patent leather shoes out in the middle of the desert. And you couldn't see another structure for as far as the eye could see. And I realized that they had dressed their daughter up in the, in the best clothes that she had to welcome the Americans in, yeah. you know, wow. to, to see that. And that's also in the book. Um, and also to put that American flag on all of those remains, the guys that handled where you saw the impact upon that individual unit where I've seen first sergeants, salty old first sergeants cry like little babies because their, their, uh, their sol their soldiers had gotten, gotten killed. Um, uh, 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 Lieutenant Colonel standing on top of a, a burned out Humvee screaming to God why he was, wants them to take them all home. You know, to me, that flag represents, it doesn't, like you said earlier, it doesn't represent politics. It, it represents duty, honor, commitment, and it means to be based upon an idea that, th that we as human beings deserve better than living under the, the boot of a, of a tyrant, to live yeah. under a regime who, who um, if, they, if you don't fit into their norms, they take you out into a field and yeah. shoot you. Shoot you know? Yeah. And, and yeah. you know, I, I had my mom, growing up, my mom's had friends who were <clears throat> Vietnamese, um, who, who I remember uh, talking to her one day, I was a small kid, and I said, Vietnam is bad. And she's like, yeah, Vietnam. I, I got out of Vietnam, but I thank God I live in America now. And she told me that um, as she remembers as a small girl washing clothes on the Mekong River and seeing body parts floating down the river. Uh, you know, and she goes, yeah. I never have to see that again for the rest of my life because I'm an American now. You know, stuff like that, that that flag is a symbol of hope. It's a symbol of freedom. It's a symbol of, of that we as a country, as an idea, can be better than who we were, uh, you know, just a few years before. That if it wasn't for that flag, there wouldn't be uh, the, the, uh, the human rights that you see now because nobody else the the, uh, the civil rights movement and all that that didn't happen anywhere else but our country you know yeah. we represent yeah. we're the example we're that that shining castle upon the the hill that everybody looks at and says to, to what they that they can emulate you know we not may not be perfect but we're a pretty damn good example of of what it means to be good and free just and, and right. free freeze a freeze a yeah I, people i don't think they realize you know with all the what other country could people get away with the protests that are going oh, on yeah. that turn violent oh, yeah. and without having a response from the government that would completely wipe the protest i mean i know i say wipe i mean run them over with tanks exactly. put machine gun fire there there's no other place and again the protests or if you want to pro the protest it's, that's the freedom we fought for that freedom as well to have the right for you to protest and do what you're doing but you got to consider yourself lucky to be doing it here because you do that anywhere else oh my it'd be mass carnage from the it'd be it would be a complete stoppage from the military coming at you it'd be tiananmen square in portland and in oh, yeah. Minneapolis and Denver and, and, and people realize how lucky that we are even just to have the ability to pro and not be mass slaughtered exactly. by a Rounded government up that, in the middle of the night that, and disappear. Exactly. You know, stuff that they were doing over in Iraq. You know, they even, exactly. they even have, yeah. they have to do anything. And if somebody, yeah. your next door neighbor was like, oh, uh, I don't like him because he's got four goats and I have two, you know. Um, then you know that you're going to get a bag over your head and disappear in the middle of the night. And nobody will ever yep. see you again. Well, that, right. that's the, that's why I'm glad you, you said because it is. We we are blessed, and that's why I always say we are blessed to be living in this country. Whatever thing you, we we are so lucky because we have the ability to do that with with minimal. And there are if you if you break the law, you break the law, but it is with minimal repercussions for the you know uh, as as a whole. We have bad apples. Yep. We've seen the bad apples, but we don't have a government that comes in and mows everybody right. down to stop it. 
to, no, for to, sure. Cool. Same yeah, thing. Well, well said, bro. Same, yeah, well said. Same thing in North Korea. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. but I, I, we, I, I think this has been a great episode. I want to end it on on something that's uh, fun and and not morbid <laughs> or anything. So Wait, I, I wish I, everybody could see Chris's face when he does the. <laughs> <laughs> we'll eventually, yeah, we'll eventually. Yeah, I wish you get a screenshot. That would be our, that yeah, would be our we, click date right there. The end, but um, <laughs> but uh, no, what I, what I was going to throw in there is, is kind of the last fun thing to ask you about is, you, as I mentioned, you got to do Jocko Willink's podcast. I've heard from people who've been on the show. He's got like a pretty badass setup. Oh, yeah. It's at a gym, yeah. right? Yeah. Just tell us about Jocko's setup. Oh, so man, I can it's, it's pretty it. awesome. <laughs> You know, um, I go in there and I knew it was in a gym. And uh, so I get there and they got a, like a coffee bar to the left and you got all these like rings, like uh, you'll have like Muay Thai fighters and one, and then you have like jujitsu mats over here and, and little t-shirt area up front. And they have an octagon that's over here further on the left side. And it's pretty intimidating when you walk in, you know. <laughs> Dude, it's cool when you it's cool when you hear about these guys who have like elaborate oh, setups, yeah. though, because I don't I think this audience gets it, but some people don't get it. Like this, what we're doing right now is the future. I, I think old media in a few years, it's gonna become pretty much obsolete. This is what people my yeah. age and much younger are doing. They're listening to podcasts, they're listening to long form interviews, stories like yours. Um, so yeah, when I hear that Jocko Willen could afford, you know, a giant setup and is getting millions upon millions of plays each episode, like that's the future, man. These these like dinosaurs in the media, it's it's not going to be around the way that it is much longer. I don't. Think. Yeah, I, you know, they had, his little room is up upstairs. It's it, it's really cool. It's soundproofed and you got this big table. It's kind of like you get about to get interrogated. So it's like little light, right? <laughs> you got cameras. You got your poly- Did you have the polygraph machine yeah. out and you got your hooked up there? All this. <laughs> Are you telling the truth? Are you not? To- yeah, yeah, that's I, that's a. I don't know, Ian. I don't know if we'll ever have it because we're never going to live in the same areas together. Never. Maybe so, if we did you- Florida. Florida would be cool. Yeah, be cool. But why don't you have it, and then I can still call in for my bedroom. <laughs> I don't know, though. I mean, let, let's just say, like, hypothetically, though, some company, you know, actually, I was going to say some company, but, you know, if you've seen what uh, they're doing with Joe Rogan with Spotify, they seem to be censoring things. I, I, if a company comes in and does not censor us and does not tell us you can't have this person on, Naples, and they're like, Florida. here's. And Naples, they're like, here's Florida. a million dollars. We're yeah. going to Naples. We're going to we're going <laughs> yeah. to the, the Gulf side, and we'll do it from uh, the Altera, which is a huge training facility awesome. out there. That that, and we'll, we'll put it. In, we'll, we'll have it in one of the CQB rooms, right? That'd be it, 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 you got to clear. You got you got to clear the hallway to get to the podcast. Here, here's, and we'll, we'll put some airsoft stuff, some op four there. Okay, here's your gun. If you don't make it to that podcast by noon, you're not going to be on it. And go. There you go. And here's a this flashbang. Is, <laughs> this has been super fun, though, man. It really has. And and even though, look, I, it's it's not exactly like the most jubilant of topics. I get it. It's a deep subject, but I think people need to hear it, and I think people need to read the book. So once again, it's no tougher duty, no greater honor. A memoir of a mortuary affairs marine, no tougher duty.com. You're holding up the book at no tougher duty is. on Twitter, at no underscore tougher <laughs> underscore duty on uh, Instagram. Pre, uh, yeah, you know, appreciate it. We'll have to have you on again. We will. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to be at, back on again. That'd it be may awesome. be another two years till Ian schedules it. He'll, he'll, <laughs> he'll keep telling you we're having it. God bless you, brother. God bless you. Thanks, man. I still see his picture, but I think it's frozen. I think, I think frozen. we're good. He's frozen. Yeah. I don't know. I think of uh, that South Park where it's like, goodbye. <laughs> no. He's still there. You remember yeah. that episode? <laughs> he thinks like he's going to go into the future, I think, or the past. <laughs> I don't remember exactly, but he, he keeps on goodbye. But then he's still there. Yeah. It's still... Anyway. Um, yeah, man. I'm I'm glad we got into that subject matter. And, uh, you know, I, I do feel bad whenever I say we're going to book someone and then it takes like well, a, an entire no, year I for know, me to I, book I, them. Uh, yeah, but, but, but can you, we, we only have so many slots and, in, in, you know, and it, it we're, we were still trying to figure out at the time how we we're going to do it. So during that time frame at the beginning. Yeah, I, I, it's it's true. From, from the very beginning, man, I have to say, man, I love I really do love the mission of what we're doing and the people that yeah. we're having on. And there's no other podcast. I mean, I mean, there's no other podcast I'd rather be doing. I, I, I don't at all miss nah. covering the minutia of the election or any of that. I think this is way more important. And 
I, every time we do a podcast, especially the last few that I think have been home runs, I, 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 there's no way people are going to hear this. And I think, and think to themselves, like, I think everybody's going to get something positive uh, out yeah. of it, is what I should no, I, I agree. I think most of our podcasts, everybody pulls something positive that you can, if you're, if you're willing to listen and, and listen, not hear, but listen, um, that you can pull something positive from it. So, um, no, I like what we're doing too, brother. And we, we, you know, guys like Christian that again, see, that's not, that's not a normal job. And I don't think there's anybody else out there that uh, other than Christian that talks about mortuary affairs and their experiences in it. I don't know anybody else. I've never read anybody. Else. No, I, I'm pretty sure it's, you know, it's almost like how Leo yeah, Jenkins yeah. said on his episode that none of those, none of you guys really, you're in a yeah, different yeah. Uh, class because your book was really yeah, CIA yeah, yeah. contracting. But none of the, none of the Rangers wrote a book until Nick yeah. Irving did it. And it was almost like we have the permission now to do it. Christian is, is a trailblazer of his own because no, there's no other book like his at no, all. Not that, and, but how he said why he did it, uh, that's why the majority, I think 99% <laughs> of veterans write books about it's not to it's not to make money. It's to get it's it's to get it out. It's to, it's it's therapeutic. It is very therapeutic. And you know, Leo's another one. I, I don't for for I don't believe for one second that Leo writes books because he needs to make money. I think he does it, especially the poetry. He needs to get get it out. This is the this is a positive, constructive way to get it out that hopefully other veterans and other people that have served or gone through traumatic experiences that may not have served but have gone through trauma. This is how you can deal with it. And this is how you can do it constructively yeah. and, and doing it where it has a positive effect, not only on yourself, because you do, you feel good. You write, but you write, I have, I, I ain't gonna lie, I, I feel good. It's it's work, but I felt good after the Ranger way. I felt good after the Patriots Creed. I did, like, man. Um, but so you're doing it partly for yourself because you want to feel good. You want to get stuff out and it makes you feel better, but also you're doing it. So hopefully somebody will read it and be like, okay, you know what? I can feel better too. Let me, this, this is the roadmap, like, like uh, Christian said, or my guy said that the FM manual, the field manual, this is how you can do it. And then having somebody come back and say, you know what? You really helped me. It's, 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 it's reciprocity over and over. You're helping, they're helping you feel good. You're helping them feel good. People are getting positive. People are moving forward. And it's just, it's just a continual positive cycle that uh, the podcast, I think is a big part of that, man, that we, that we have right now. So yeah, I, I completely agree with you on all fronts with it. Yeah. Outstanding. Yeah, and and I, I want to visit Leo's place in Mexico. I f I feel like a day in the life of him is just like surfing, tanning, probably drinking some. And beers, going to Cabo you know, Wabo like, and hanging out and and drinking, drinking some at, at one of Sammy Hagar's place. Out. Yeah, yeah. I want. I really do want to go visit at some point, and I and I could tell Leo's the type of guy that uh, that I could call him and just be like, "Hey, I'm gonna come visit hey. you in Mexico." <laughs> cool. I do, I really don't think he'd have any reservations about it. So I I genuinely am gonna take him up at some point. Yeah, you need. Um, you know what? That's where um. <laughs> When me and Tan my when me and Tanya had our we didn't ever have a we, we talked about on the phone we didn't ever have a wedding, but when we we did a kind of kind of a uh, just a ceremony when I was I came back from a trip from Ranger Battalion or wait wait no it was when I had the break in service actually that's when I had so we got married and right before I went to Ranger School which was two early uh, late uh, two thousand and then we had our little ceremony like a little ceremony it was it was in um. Cabo San Lucas at, at the, uh, at a little resort there. It was six, seven years later that we did it. And I can tell you from being there, you need to go there. Cause that's where Leo, from what I, it, lives. Yeah, yeah. it is, it's just, it's so, it is, it's, it's laid back chill. It's you think of Cabo, Cabo Wabo and Sammy Hagar. That's what you, and it's just surfing and relaxing and just drinking. It looks awesome. It, it, and then the question is, it, you know, would you do ayahuasca with Leo? No, nah. <laughs> I don't know if I would either. I'm not. A, I'm not a big drug guy, but I've heard such positive things about you ayahuasca. Know, I take yeah. it back. But then again, I I would probably freak out and I'd be like running around, being like, oh, I can't handle this. I, I take it back. <laughs> if it was with Leo, yeah, I probably would. I I would. No, I, I would because I think I I know I'd be able to handle it fine. Um, not that I'm, I, but that I, is true. You have to be around people that you trust just yeah. from my experience with marijuana, which is the only experience I have. If you're around people that, that you, that you think are sketchy, that's when you <laughs> you get all paranoid. It's happened to me. 
But if I was with Leo, yeah, I'd probably have a fun time. But uh, <laughs> yeah, but... with that, uh, wrapping things up here, Fort Scott Munitions is a manufacturer of multi-federal patented solid copper and brass CNC spun ammunition that is designed to tumble upon impact in soft tissue, leaving devastating wound channels for faster bleed out and quicker incapacitation. This ammunition was originally developed to innovate and improve on the standard of military grade ammunition design. It was found that not only did the TUI ammunition outperform competitors in the self-defense industry, but it quickly became apparent that it would be a top contender for hunters alike. With the ammunition being CNC spun, the tolerances are some of the tightest on the market, ensuring that you receive the same results with each pull of the trigger. Fort Scott Munitions is available throughout privately owned businesses in all 50 states, as well as directly online through F-O-R-T-S-C-O-T-T-M-U-N-I-T-I-O-N-S.com, FortScottMunitions.com. Link is in the description and use the promo code BATTLELINE for 15% off your order, only available to our listeners. Support us, support Fort Scott, BATTLELINE, promo code FortScottMunitions.com. They're a proud supporter of Chris Peranto, BATTLELINE Tactical, and the BATTLELINE Podcast. Uh, since this is going up on Monday, I should say to all you out there, have a great Halloween. Or just go trick-or-treating, except in Nebraska where it's butt-ass cold. <laughs> just dress warm yeah happy halloween everybody go dress up go wear a mask for real a real mask and have fun <laughs> not the not the mask that you think you all look like bane in because you don't <laughs> go 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 get me all right take care everyone yeah. That's all for this episode of the Battle Line Podcast, but we'll be back on Monday with more American Straight Talk. Until then, be sure to follow us on Instagram at Battle Line Podcast and on Twitter at Battle Line Pod. To sign up for future Battle Line tactical courses, go to www.christantoperanto.net. Believe in yourself, face all challenges head on, and as always, never quit. <laughs> <laughs>